Hey everybody, Josh from Silka here. Today, uh, gonna answer some FAQs, or frequently asked questions. And uh, as I was getting started, the uh, my dog here in the background actually got me a little off topic um, that turns out to be relevant. So people ask me, uh, they say, Josh, why does your dog uh, think he's a cat and sleep on the top of the couch? And that's a good question. Um, my answer is generally that that dog is a moron. And uh, why that's relevant is that my question today uh, to address to you comes uh, in regards to this thing that people see in our videos and uh, they keep asking questions about what is that thing holding your bike in the work stand? Um, this is a Silka Hirabel clamp. And how does that relate to the dog being a moron. Well, uh, it's when you think about the construction of a carbon fiber bicycle, you think of the tubing, um, there is quite frankly, there is more carbon on the ends. Um, those of you who've been in the sport for a while might remember uh, Ross Schaefer at IBIS years ago, uh, very cleverly poked fun at Columbus, who had a tube set called Genius uh, when he made a tube set called Moron, more on the ends. Um, but this is the same principle uh, here, ultimately, as to why we uh, didn't invent the Hirabel. Uh, we actually went and bought the company, uh, I guess a similar time period throwback, you remember the guy with the razor on TV. I liked it so much I bought the company. That, quite frankly, was me with, uh, with this product. So why do you need something like this? Well, we'll take a look here at uh, modern bicycles. Uh, carbon ones in particular, and the couple things to notice uh, are that, you know, when the work stands that you're using, that I'm using, that the bike shop is using, when those were developed, uh, in some cases 40, almost 50 years ago, uh, the tubing on your bike was round, right? Typically a one inch, uh, give or take, and round. So. You know, we can look, here's the park work stand uh, that you see in some of the videos that we shoot. Uh, you see that clamp, it's round. It actually, it's so old in its design that it's not just round, but the upper clamp has the indent for the external uh, cable housing. In the old days, you had the uh, rear brake cable would route right down over top of the, uh, the top of the top tube. And that channel in the clamp there was to close up over that. Uh, and not pinch the cable when you were clamping the top tube. Um, fast forward a few years, this is probably now going on a 20-year-old design. This is the uh, what we now know as the Feedback Sports clamp. Originally, it was the ultimate uh, brand behind this. And this one's interesting to me, and I think quite clever, in that it is uh, octagonal, right? Which is a little bit different. Um, than anything previous, and instead of closing like the park stand uh, kind of in this axis, it actually closes uh, in this axis uh, when you look at it. Now that, again, with round steel tubing uh, was not such a big deal. But as we get to modern bikes, uh, first we stop doing steel tubing so much, unless you're old school like me, and then we stop doing round. And I think the, this combination of things starts to present a, a real problem. So my journey with this product was, you know, four years ago, I was in Europe at the service course for one of the Pro Tour teams, who I won't mention, um, but they were riding Pinarellos. And I walked into the service course to see uh, my mechanic friends, who I was going to be spending the next couple weeks with, uh, literally all of the team bikes upside down uh, on the floor kind of with cardboard and some pillows and some towels and some moving blankets uh, and was a little bit confused until I learned from them that uh, the bikes could only be worked on on the floor because the team uh, the bike sponsor for the team banned them from having work stands that would clamp the frames they're only allowed to use the fork mounted work stand like this one um, that you see at all the Pro Tour races. Now, these fork mount stands are awesome for cleaning the bikes and for doing a basic drivetrain maintenance, right? You know, a little barrel adjust, a little limit screw adjust, um, get everything clean and lubed. But they're terrible for bike assembly, headset work, uh, you know, any sort of headset 
um, you know, stem, handlebar, cable routing uh, type thing. Can't really uh, install or adjust front brakes, right, because you don't have the front wheel in there. Um, there's a lot of limitations to these work stands, but they are the only work stands that the pro teams are allowed to use by the bike makers. Now, why is that? Well, it's because uh, the modern bike is no longer round nor steel, and in some cases, the... Uh, the tube thickness, like, you know, right in the middle of the top tube here, um, can be as, as few as four or five plies of carbon. There's even one bike uh, in the market right now, I will not name it, but it comes with not only a do not clamp, but a do not sit on the top tube uh, warning because that top tube is so thin. Why is the top tube so thin, you ask? It's because it honestly isn't doing much. Uh, for the performance of the bicycle. It's really there to help with some torsional stiffness. Um, it's actually quite key in preventing speed wobble um, that we can get to that uh, to that later, but really it's just kind of keeping the bike from doing one of these. It's pure tension, pure compression uh, member. And from a carbon perspective, that's a great place to take weight out of the bike. Um, because yeah, it's not doing a whole lot, right? It's not like a C-tube or a down tube or a bottom bracket junction. Uh, or, you know, or even a, up near the seat cluster, right? So, uh, top tubes have become very weak, none of them are round. Seat tubes now, uh, not round, much stronger, but uh, not round. And as they have become less and less round, they have elongated for aerodynamic reasons. And that's where we get into some interesting things with the work stands in the market uh, previously, or I guess the clamping designs. You look at the, the park design, and we'll show it here. Uh, and watch as it actuates. It doesn't close uh, linearly, right, around the circle. It actually has a hinging motion, okay? And so it's coming in on an arc. Well, as the tube gets deeper, the arc is hitting at a, a kind of a higher and higher angle um, and actually can put on some aero tube shapes, can put some really bizarre forces uh, into that tube. Now, we might think that the feedback design here is going to fix that, but it's a completely the wrong axis. It's uh, actually orthogonal to the axis you would want it to be on. And an airfoil can be quite strong when clamping on the length of the airfoil, tip to tail. Uh, but in this case, the orientation of that clamp is actually smushing the airfoil uh, in its sides, which is where it's weakest, and quite frankly, from a design perspective, is where the designers have to put the least material, right? It's a lot of surface area, and because it's not doing a whole lot uh, structurally, um, that's the thinnest part of the tube. So we get to a point where we start seeing a lot of bike shops, pro teams and others, uh, crushing frames with, uh, with these clamps. There's been a million designs out there. I honestly spent about a year working on a design, uh, quite clever, sort of a, I would call it a windshield washer, multi-pivot concept, uh, and really just couldn't get to where I could resolve the forces in the way that I wanted. Um, with the basic problem being, and I'll use this guy as the tube, you know, you think of it from a, a torque perspective. If I'm clamping, uh, you know, the average uh, clamp is, is something like seven and a half centimeters of, uh, of width, eight centimeters. You know, we'll call it, we'll call it three inches. Um, if I'm clamping over a three inch uh, area here and you put, oh, let's do it this way, and you put, uh, call it 10 pounds of force here, two feet away, right? You now have 10 pounds times two feet, that's 20 foot pounds. But that 20 foot-pounds is going to resolve in this clamp, and if it's three inches long, uh, that's a one and a half inch and a one and a half inch lever, essentially, from the, the axis of rotation. Um, you end up with some incredibly high forces here trying to resolve the 20 foot-pounds, because you're resolving it over inches. Um, so in a lot of cases, it isn't even the clamping pressure that is damaging the tube. It's actually this torque resolution um, you know, I, I would say typically I've heard it most often uh, at the bike shop level when somebody's doing either headset work or even just something as simple as wrapping the handlebars. You know, a, a 10 pound load on the handlebars, you can be, you know, a three feet away from the tube that you've clamped and now all of a sudden that's a 30 foot pound torque that's being resolved over a couple of inches. And um, you can see localized stresses uh, in the tubing 
in the, um, well, really in the 1,000 PSI range, uh, which can be enough to damage the frames. If you watch, and we will link it below, um, the, uh, <clears throat> the interview we did with Sean Small from Ruckus Composites, uh, you know, he says they receive probably five to ten frames a week uh, with this sort of damage, uh, and not all of them are repairable. So it's more common, I think, than probably most of us think. Um, yeah, so there's sort of the uh, the need, right? This is me coming into it from a need perspective. Well, we find Hirabel, and what has Hirabel done um, to solve this? And I think this is where we get back to our moron uh, entry. The Hero Bell has solved this by using these uh, kind of conical silicone pieces to support the tubing, but it's supporting the tubing at the ends and at their junctions, which is where naturally the carbon fiber has to be made thicker to support the loads uh, as they transition from tube to tube within the bike. In a lot of cases, you are going to see wall thickness in a carbon fiber frame between four and eight times thicker uh, at the tube junctions than in the middle of the tubes themselves. So with this Hero Bell, you can put the uh, seat tube, top tube junction here and slide, and we loosen our piece up here, slide this up to the uh, head tube, top tube junction. Those are two incredibly strong, heavily built uh, tubing interfaces. You're actually touching top tube across and then seat tube and head tube. So you're now spreading that load across three tubes uh, worth of force. And then you have the adjustable uh, adjustability in these cones to turn them so that they can fit various shapes from round to square to arrow. Uh, really everything is accommodated uh, in the shape of the cones. And then, instead of a rigid clamp, we have this extra beefy, stretchy um, strap that straps over the top. And I like to liken that, uh, in my description, to the upper of a shoe. You know, you, you would never buy a shoe for your foot that was a rigid upper and a rigid sole, and you are clamping your foot in between them. You would break the foot, uh, or at least be terribly uncomfortable. And if you look, uh, there are actually medieval torture devices that look just like this that uh, they would use to torture people. Um, that's why shoes have a rigid side and a flexible, conformable side. That's really the same concept here. You've got this kind of semi-rigid, uh, these silicone cones, uh, and then you've got this flexible, uh, slightly compliant upper that's just applying pressure to hold the thing in the cones, um, distributed across the entire exposed surface of the tube, but it's not rigid uh, and it's not able to apply enough point load to cause any damage. Now, uh, the last piece of this that I think is interesting is uh, the material for these cones. It is a medical grade silicone, and this comes to bite us when we get to the cost uh, of the Hero Bell. A lot of people say, you know, gosh, it's $150 for a stick, uh, and I get it, it looks like a stick. Um, but, but it's actually uh, some pretty expensive pieces. This 100% U.S. made uh, CNC machine 7000 series aluminum standoffs, and these are medical grade silicone uh, cones. Why medical grade silicone? Well, in the search for paint safety, uh, non-marring, non-scratching, and non-damaging to the paint, you quickly learn that there's a million kinds of paint out there, and they don't always interact well with rubbers and plastics. Now, why is that? This is the same reason that we can't mix uh, similar greases or oils with uh, similar material seals, right? You think about it, if I've got a silicone seal, I cannot put silicone grease in that assembly uh, because they're like molecules and the silicone rubber seal will absorb the silicone grease and will actually grow. Um, the same goes for, you know, a, a a nitrile seal, right? You want to avoid uh, the, the nitrile oils. And so on. I mean, there's, there's got hundreds of these if you think about it. Um, the interesting thing with paints, you've got the whole series of solvent-based paints, those whole series of water-based paints, all sorts of things uh, in there to, to control viscosity, to control color fastness. Um, but silicone is the most avoided chemical in 
paint because it uh, is an it, it is anti-adhesion. Okay, and so you keep silicone as far away from paint as possible, and they don't put silicone in any type of paint uh, because it just causes problems. Now, what that means is that we can identify silicone as the perfect thing to use to cradle something that's painted because there is no opportunity uh, for there to be a like-like interaction where the two, uh, you know, want to join each other and start swapping uh, molecules uh, or ions, and so. We have to go all the way to this super high purity, 99.998% pure uh, medical grade silicone. But what that guarantees you is that not only is it non-marring and non-scratching, but even if you leave your bike uh, in this clamp, in the sunlight, in extreme heat, in the desert, um, in Death Valley for a month, that the paint and the cones are not going to bond to each other uh, ever, uh, and they're not going to trade any of the coloration uh, between them because there is no like-like uh, interaction. So there you go, a uh, little history of the Hirabel, why we have it and why we use it. Um, you may not have ever broken a carbon frame before. You may not know anybody who's broken a carbon frame before, but trust me, it happens all the time. And as frames get lighter and lighter, uh, I think we just continue to walk down this path to needing a better solution than uh, rigid frame clamps. Remember, if you wouldn't uh, clamp your foot in it, uh, you probably don't want to clamp your super expensive carbon bike in it. So there you go, the Silka Hero Bell uh, Universal Frame Clamp. Uh, really the solution to all your carbon fiber problems uh, when I put my salesman hat on. Um, have any questions, uh, please drop them below. Please remember to like and subscribe, and please share with all your friends so we can spread the knowledge uh, of the cycling industry amongst us. Uh, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you soon.